So this is GIS Programming 2, GST8010, Module 7 Lecture, Lecture 2 of 2, and we're going to look at HTML5 uh, some, and uh, other concepts in there uh, on the Cascading Style Sheet area, doing a little bit deeper dive into some of these topics to see if it can help us with our app development when we're using things like the ArcGIS JavaScript API and CalSight Sign System. So I'm instructor Robert Hewlett, and you can contact me via the email address below. The general learning outcome is to master, know, and understand all content, concepts discussed in lab and lecture, and the assigned readings. The specific learning outcomes for this lecture, although not an absolute list, uh, describe the various methods to search the DOM, query selector and its variants, get element, uh, by ID, tag name, and all those different variants on that uh, method. List the ev uh, events available for the window. And so this would be uh, the browser window. Maybe you need to uh, tie, in, tie into the window somehow. Uh, maybe you need to tie into the document, which is uh, like the HTML file that's been loaded and hydrated inside uh, the window. And then even at a finer detail would be all the individual pieces within a, within that HTML document, let's say. And those would be the elements. So list the events available uh, for elements in general. So the table tag, the PR tag, the div tag, and that form tags. So uh, listening for people, clicking on them, hovering on them, moving, dragging them around, dragging, dropping something on them, those types of concepts. We're going to define issue resolution and implement issue resolution in the lab. So searching the DOM. Uh, so you got choices. <laughs> so finding elements in the DOM. So uh, typically uh, uh, searching those tags, so those angle brackets and their attributes, or using their attributes as a way of searching for them. So that what it is is you could have an HTML document that has lots of div, but you're particularly interested in a certain div and so that would be like the view div and that on so so method one you could just use query selector and there is a search pattern that you give it uh, but the way it works is the first one it bumps into that's the one you get okay and that and so there's a there is a string matching pattern that we can take a look at and that uh, also uh, query selector all so it'll return many possibly everything that matched that pattern uh, you'll get back so you know in a classic I mean document today if you search by something that's a div you'd get a lot of things back typically in that again it matches a search pattern uh, get document um, or document dot get element by ID so you're specifically looking for the, what is the attribute value for this attribute called ID inside a tag. That's one way to search. We usually want these to be unique in all honesty. So uh, on Android, it's find element by ID on the interface and it they have to be unique. And so it's meant to find a unique part of the interface in that. Um, and there should only be one thing matching that number, but that's you being diligent about how you name things in that. And so within a tag, uh, like I said, you're looking for an attribute, ID is equal to some value. Uh, and it returns, you know, the first one. Uh, Document.getElements, it is plural by tag name. So it's going to be like query selector above matching on a pattern, but you put a name in and it's more like, hey, equals that the, the tag name equals this, like uh, H1 tags or P tags or div tags, DIV tags and that. And it does return many, so that little s is, is the difference there. Method 5, get elements, plural, by class name. And, uh, and class name is, again, looking at that attribute called class, right? Just like the how element ID works, right? Uh, by class name, that would be the closest one, is you're looking for <clears throat> in the... Uh, the class is equal to something. This is classic. This is how we apply, you know, styles in the cascading style sheet uh, to a bunch of elements. I mean, it should be fast, right? The, the browser already has to go find those those elements quickly to apply a style to them. So hopefully, the function that you're calling is just as fast. Uh, that would be the hope. But again, it's 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 based on that attribute value called class, um, and versus this one being ID, and this one's actually the element name. 
in that. So there's lots of, like there's lots of ways built into the document object to query. And you're hoping that Firefox, Chrome, that those developers are bought into making that a really fast search, right? That you find those things quickly and then your code can run uh, type of thing. But you have lots of things available to you. Uh, I mean, I grew up in the get element ID era. That's sort of like how I always hunted. But after using query selector for a little bit, um, query selector can basically do all the searches, I guess, that uh, uh, by class name, by tag name, by ID. You can do the exact same search with query selector. So let's say you wanted to like, you know, streamline your JavaScript development process. It, it could be why I see query selector more, more and more people using it is because query selector, because of that pattern can basically do what all these others can do. And then the real question about query selectors, are you looking for one or many uh, query selector, query selector all in that. So because query selector is so powerful and you're I mean, it's a bit of an assumption that you're assuming that Firefox, Chrome, and Safari, and Opera, and all those uh, uh, groups, developer groups, are really bought into making Query Selector fast, right? I'm not ever going to rewrite Query Selector. I'm really going to lean into that. I'm hoping that Chrome's good at that because it's such a common thing that any uh, uh, a web page would have to do today in terms of an application running there. Not so much static content, but definitely if things are changing on the page and reactivity. Uh, so it's a very clear and concise page here if you want to take a look uh, in that. Um, i got a war list here uh, of the ones that I, I kind of like. So if there's a dot at the beginning of your search pattern, it knows you're hunting for a class. And this is kind of how your styles are set up in Cascading Style Sheets. So you pre you pretty well, you know, I'm hedging, right, educated guests that because they're already doing this in the Cascade style sheet document, they need to be really fast at it. <clears throat> Otherwise, their browser is going to be slow and no one will want to use it in that. If it's got uh, the uh, hashtag, that's a classic query selector for an ID in that. They also got these other interesting uh, characters uh, like the angle bracket. So I'm hunting for a child inside a parent. So there's a pattern. I'm looking for a canvas inside a div, <laughs> right? That sort of thing. Um, and Or I need a certain order. You know, it's got to be, if the pattern's like, if you find this pattern of div, table, paragraph, that's what I'm looking for in that. But there's a whole bunch of like search syntax on how to find these things. Um, if, if you have, uh, instead of the angle bracket, you have like, I'm looking for all the uh, P elements inside a div element. Uh, uh, this one here just goes one level deep. Uh, if it's a space instead of uh, the angle uh, greater than symbol, uh, then it's going to do what's called a recursive, uh, basically a recursive in in that. It's going to keep drilling, right, in that. So if you had a div with a paragraph tag with a div with a paragraph tag, would you get both P tags? Well, if it's a space, you will. If it's the, if it's the original angle bracket, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> the example I just gave might work in both. Um, but one, one is a recursive uh, sort of find or search, and one is like a one level deep in that. Uh, a star in this means means contains. Uh, are you doing a, a tag is equal to div kind of concept? Uh, commas, uh, a list of searches in a list. So you can have, hey, search for all these elements like h1, comma, h2, comma, h3. Find them all, change the font in that. And so there's a whole bunch start with, ends with, uh, and that. Uh, this is, I think, this is like out of like the Vim days. Uh, that, <laughs> that stuff. Um, that's still hanging around. Uh, so that may be very foreign to you. A dollar means the end. No, no, no. Lots of tools on Linux uh, where dollar meant end in that versus the beginning of the line. Carrot, the beginning of the line, dollar, the end of the line in that. Um, in that. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can build up to do your search patterns in that. Um, so it makes Query Selector very flexible in that. Uh, so I got, you know, uh, if you're looking for a, a, if you just say, hey, calcite hyphen shell, well, it's going to find all these elements called calcite hyphen shell. That's its default operation. If you just give me a chunk of text and it doesn't have any dots or anything in it, I'm just going to say, assume it's an element name in that. If it's dot intro, you're looking for class intro. Again, this is very, you know, CSS kind of deal in that. And, and you're, no, I'm assuming, hedging that the browser needs to be fast at that. So this, this search should also be fast. 
Uh, so if it's got a uh, hashtag in there, you're looking for IDs equal to somewhere in the document, right? And uh, you can go element, element. So you get uh, all those elements separated by a comma in that, one inside the other in that. Uh, well, one is uh, for, uh, first two after one uh, kind of thing. Um, so find me the first uh, element after element one with the plus symbol. So there's lots of different search patterns. Uh, and then sort of, again, this is almost like a recursive, oh, well, well, one versus all and stuff in that. Uh, so there's lots of different uh, ways of searching. And like I said, if you wanted to say, do I have to remember all those functions in that? Well, you could say, you know, because, you know, get element by ID by tag name and that kind of are built into the query selector already and kind of matches cascading style sheet. So if you are doing cascading style sheet type stuff, then you're kind of familiar with that. So that would be an easy transition for you. And then you could just sort of say, I'm just going to focus on query selector, query selector all and that. Um, and just, but that means uh, what's, everything's trade-off, right? Everything's trade-off, what's the trade-off? Got to learn this search syntax and that. Or be able to look it up real quick. <laughs> so why search the DOM? <laughs> why, why are we searching this thing and that? <clears throat> so I do that. Uh, what I call backend hooks. So this style where you're doing like ECMAScript local in that. So a separation of concerns, your index file can be sometimes pretty terse. And the big, the big thing it does is, hey, go run the script called main, JS. And main immediately says, hey, go hook to this button or find, find, this, uh, find this div and use it for the chart or find this div and use it for the map view in that. So backend hooks. Uh, and we use those for, like I said, object creation and population, for map views, for scene views, for different lists, especially if it's like a select. Hey, go find this select. Like in HTML, there's no options. Find this select, add a bunch of options to it, add, add an event listener so I can tell when someone selected something and all that, all the widgets hooking into them. In that. And reactivity, like I, the, the list thing is almost like a reactivity thing. Hey, someone changed their selection, do something about it kind of deal, so uh, triggering promises and uh, events as well. Uh, one is, if we're going to have an event listener, well, who are you going to listen for? You got to go find them. This is the who, add the event listener to it, and so when something happens in in that uh, HTML element, react to it. And uh, and to do that, you need this thing, you got to find it and then hook to it. And that. And these are these event handlers like uh, Annette. It's just event handlers in general. If you want to listen for any kind of event on an element, then you know you have to first find that element, add an event listener, decide what event you want to listen for, and what function you want to fire fire off when it happens in that. So that's why we're searching, typically searching the DOM. Like, I mean, we could do searches like, hey, go change everything from blue to red in that. But right now I'm like in this app paradigm. And in the app paradigm, uh, I'm really, it's really about the reactivity. Uh, something changed. The map extent changed on the map, react to it. Someone selects something to drop down list, react to it. Someone ch uh, changed their choice in a radio button group. Someone slid a toggle from on to off, react to it. But to do all that stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, I first need to react to who. You gotta f go search who and then glue together your code and the who. Uh, and then you have something happening. Lots of stuff like OnClick and others, like I said. There's a, we went through that list in a previous lecture, a big list of all the different uh, HTML element events that you can respond to, drag and move and mouse over, mouse left, mouse button click and all this. And so I'm going to talk, uh, switch gears a little bit, because when you, uh, you know, how can you, I guess in one way, from the HTML document, push a little bit of data in it, you know? It just might be a little bit like you know, trying, you're trying to figure out, well, which, I have this action bar in Calcite, which action did they actually click on, right? And so something as simple as, as their name or, a stand, or having a standard way to do that. And so uh, there are two kind of ways out there uh, that exist and we'll talk about them. Uh, and so it, in, the idea is, you know, we're embedding a little bit of data on the interface HTML side so that when we encode, we can kind of figure out decipher or more accurately figure out who we're dealing with in that. It gives some flexibility into how we write our code as well. Right, so uh, first I'm gonna talk about element and microdata. I went down this path, just gonna warn you uh, in that. Uh, 
and we'll take a look. There's two ways. There's there's element data and micro data. So we'll talk about the data part. Data part first is probably the most important. It's what you're going to see in a lot of calcite examples. Probably the way to do it in terms of figuring out something like, hey, what button did I just click on or what icon in that. There is also something, like I said, this micro data stuff. And I did go down this path, wrote some code against it. And I'm like, nah, nah, not for me. Uh, not for what I was thinking anyway in that. So we'll talk about element data, the first part here. Right. So there's two things. Uh, and I'm not going to element data. We'll call it and then micro data, which is, you know, they both say data. It'd be easy to get them uh, crossed over in that. But when we when I when I say element data and this this concept in HTML5 where we extended tags so where we could embed a little bit of data in there so we knew who which tag we were dealing with and that is uh or we didn't want to do it with IDs or something like that. Uh, is we you can have a bunch of attributes right in the tag itself and that is IDs and attribute classes and attribute we've been using those but you can have a bunch of other attributes that start with data hyphen okay and that and so the data hyphen part is a trigger for them for that information to be organized in this thing called the data set on the JavaScript side in that so in JS land we won't see data hyphen no hyphens so in that but anything that starts with the data hyphen right gets put into this this little uh, Java JavaScript collection called data set so and so every element could have a data set uh, there it may be empty because no one's using the data hyphen tags or uh, attribute values in that and so the big thing is in HTML land it's the the attribute so inside the tag inside the angle brackets there's some, there's an attribute called data hyphen something is equal to double quote double quote in that and so then it gets organized in this nice little we'll call it a JavaScript collection uh, and that key value pair uh, based on and the keys the keys are based on what comes after this hyphen and where the hyphens are converted to the camel case equivalent that seems to be fun definition here if you want to check it out in that and then this other thing called micro data right <clears throat> in that and there's more details here on the micro data uh, but how you get to it how you get to it in uh, JavaScript land is it's element get attribute and you're looking for some typically something called item type or item property in that so it sounds like well it sounds like it, it, it could be a way to do it and, and that sort of thing but this the micro data has a different purpose uh is what i found out even from coding you're like whoo yeah didn't like that uh the 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 element data you know element dot data set was like yeah yeah that's more what i was thinking for when i was looking for the purpose i had where okay we have a bunch of icons load it in the action panel which one did they click on i mean you could go by id in all honesty but uh this seems to be uh, a way to do it like i said uh it's the play-doh thing right right it's play-doh uh how do you want to do it yet yeah, maybe too many choices in that Right, and so the big thing is there's all these attributes that start with item, like I said, item prop, item value. Yes, item prop. The one thing about this, the more you read about micro data, right, the real reason it's there is to help convert like an HTML document that isn't that structured, kind of free willing, into more of, into into a data set like JSON, and like. And like, okay, that's not even close to what I'm doing with the icon thing. <laughs> and, that, and that's why, that's probably why it uh, wasn't, uh, the gears were grinding on that because, you know, they're a completely different thing in that. But it does help what it's meant to do, right? It's meant to do uh, web crawlers from Google and that or some other tools to this HTML document. How do we add a little bit more structure to it so that programmatically we can, you know, uh, convert it into some JSON data and then feed that into another process. And it's like, the, and then you're like, okay, that's a little, getting a little far off what I was trying to do with the icon things in the action panel and that sort of thing. And so you see item item prop, uh, item type used a lot. But again, it's more for this, it's more for, hey, how do we, in terms of interoperability, set up the conversion of an HTML document into another XML document or JSON would be the equivalent today. So what you can do is pause this video lecture. I have a little bit of a, 
a micro data data set uh, demo set up so you can see how they're different. Again, you can pause this video lecture and watch the demo on the data set example. What I'm going to do now is switch gears to grid layouts. There are lots of <laughs> lots of options in cascading style sheets, just so you know. Um, and so flex is one, uh, and that in grid layouts um, is it a better option than flex? Could be, maybe depends. Flex keeps it nice and simple. Flex is it would be easy for uh, going from a bigger screen to a smaller screen because this rows just just go down one level and come after each other and that kind of stuff. Grid layout, a little different. Never hurts to look at a picture <laughs> and, and that sort of thing. Um, the one thing about grids is they look like tables, so we immediately see cells. And so we kind of have to, and that's okay. You're starting out, it's exactly what I did. It was my struggle until I capitulated. And, uh, and you know, the grid is this concept of grid lines, not cells at all. Oh, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and this get what would be an equivalent of that? Maybe more like a drawing grid where you're snapping things, right? So maybe, right? So we see grid layout, we see tables and cells. No, 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 no. It's more of like a design plane and you're snapping to things. And so uh, you're snapping to this invisible grid in the background. That might be a better way to think of it. And how do you express in cascading style sheet? syntax, hey, this element starts at this part of the grid and snaps to this, you know, you know, five lines away and that sort of thing. So what we're looking at here is a grid layout uh, and it's got, the one problem is, I mean, the reason people look at it as rows and columns is because in the cascading cell sheet, you say rows and columns. So it's only, it's understandable that you immediately go to cells um, in that, but then there's this whole grid line concept that you use a lot, which is not really cell based. In that so you have this thing called grid lines right so i have uh if i have a thing you say oh, we start with rows first so let's do that row major i have two rows one two so what does that mean that means you're gonna get three grid lines okay so however many rows you conceptually think you're gonna get plus one grid lines same for columns right this is actually set up for three columns one two three so i get four grid lines that's that four and two, two rows, right? And this is my grid line, uh, one, two, three. So two rows, three grid lines for rows, three columns, four grid lines for rows. So it's plus one, always, in that. Count starts at one, that's another important thing. Count starts at one, one, right? One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Uh, four, almost hit the minus one. Oh, minus one. In negative indexing is allowed. It's another way to express it, right? I don't know how many columns it got to, uh, all the way to the end. Minus one in that. And so we're negative. That sounds so weird until you get used to Python and slicing and negative indexing. And JavaScript now has negative indexing for slicing too. And so it's a thing. It's a thing. Um, and so um, the reason we can see these lines here uh, coming down this way is because I've got a grid gap set. And I recommend always setting that and actually setting the rows and columns differently so that you can visually see, okay, that's the column, that's the row, and that sort of thing. And so uh, this is what a grid layout is. The, the big thing, what you, so what does it mean? What does it all mean, right? The, how is this different than flex? The big thing here is that the map, right, here to here is spanning two rows, spanning two rows. Right, that's the kicker. Lots of the big magic there. And then over here I have a chart and over here I have a KPI key performance indicator in that. So this is what uh, we're gonna talk about, but some of this stuff you just gotta see in action and then the parts start clicking, okay? But before we get there, these are, there's, I got a video, a demo video coming up. So, uh, but let's talk about some concepts we should we should be looking for in that to just even start uh, with grid. So there are uh, there are many videos on YouTube and it's easy to go down a rabbit hole and get lost and actually get confused about the whole grid concept. This one's pretty clear. 
except he goes over he goes over a lot of different techniques. But uh, it's one that clicked for me. Hopefully, it clicks for you. I have my own coming up. Maybe that helps in that. It wasn't until I, you know, like as usual, started with a blank uh, slate and started trying some stuff where I was like, okay, now I'm start. Okay, I got that part, got that part, that kind of stuff. And even conventions uh, and that uh, started, okay, got to start doing things differently. Uh, and, and that, you know, I've been kind of sloppy in some of my HTML in the past and, and stuff. So I'll get that cleaned up in that. So some core, you know, box concepts right because this grid layout we're in you know just just one small piece of cascading style sheets and so we're down in this w3 consortium uh grid layout uh kind of thing uh so one thing for me uh always be in lowercase when you do this stuff always use hyphens right this is not a camel case deal let's not do that that is, uh otherwise here's the otherwise right you will be fighting standard conventions and all the samples out there in that. So on the cascading style sheet, they really seem to roll lowercase and they love their hyphens in that. And it's hard because when you're doing HTML web development, you're over in JavaScript doing camel case, right? And that's the standard there. So you're going to be able to apply two standards uh, or have two standards in your head. And as you flip documents, keep them consistent and straight in that. But in the end, I just, uh, maybe it's another form of capitulation. I said, no, nah, I just got to throw in the towel and just match. Because then none of the stuff I'm seeing uh, out there is looking like the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, uh, it's grid lines, not cells, which is tough because the words in the cascading style sheet are rows and columns. So it's a natural thing to think cells, right? And that. Um, and so if you say two rows, you'll get three grid lines going vertically. Uh, and that, if I said five columns, uh, I would have six grid lines horizontally, right? Uh, and so you have a grid line right at the beginning of your page and right at the end, uh, let's, let's say right at the left of your page, right at the right of your page, like your boundary grid lines, you have one at the top and bottom, right? So however many rows you conceptualize, columns you conceptualize, it'll be M plus one grid lines, count starts at one, right? And so it's always, it's always weird that, hey, I said two rows, but I got three lines in that, but it's, you know, uh, in that. So it's always M plus one in that. Count starts at one, really important. Okay, <laughs> really important. Not zero, one, because uh, you'll be over JavaScript. Count starts at zero, right? Great. Two worlds you got to keep sort of uh, contained in that. Uh, negative indexing is allowed. So uh, instead of you having to know the total number of rows, if you ever need to get all the way to the all the way to the right, let's say it's minus one, or all the way to the bottom. That would be minus one, or uh, all the way to the bottom, but back up one, <laughs> back up one row, minus two. Uh, so negative indexing is allowed uh, if it works for you, right? It's something you got to play around with. In that, uh, things always uh, because of certain, I guess, implicit ordering that comes about when you're defining things. Uh, just it is row major. I say that here. So when you're saying a number. If you're going to have two numbers that's describing rows and columns, the cascading style sheet is implicitly uh, going to assume that the first number is the number of rows or something about rows, and the second number, you know, if we're doing row column things all at once, that the second number is the columns. So that's, that does mean it's row major in that. So rows first uh, and columns second. Uh, use the developer tools in Chrome. Or Firefox, so whatever your browser is, uh, I've tested both. Just for, so you know, right now, visually, and I'll this will be in my demo video. That quarter two, two thousand four, we'll say, and that uh, we're not probably not even there yet. Uh, but uh, Firefox do this a little better of a deal on this. So I think uh, you know, whoever the Firefox developers are, they actually do some cascading style sheets because they put they put some good stuff in there. Really good separation on the labels so that your labels don't collide. Uh, I had problems with the uh, in Chrome with my uh, row index numbering and and uh, column index numbering. You know, kind of colli colliding on top of each other every once in a while. In that, so in a cl nice clean separation there in Firefox. Uh, the previous graphic is actually out of out of Chrome, so it wouldn't hurt to if you don't use Firefox a lot. This might be a chance to to get to know it, and it does for grid layout designs and seeing how they're going to look. It does a really good job in developers' tools. It even has a really nice 
thing where uh, it highlights like if you have an overflow issue, which means that uh, you've exceeded the available space and that also that was really nice uh, something I didn't see pop in Chrome but I mean Chrome just updated like a couple days ago so maybe there's new stuff in there already in that um, another thing that uh, that became apparent was that the width of the browser is restricted by the by your monitor screen right so your monitor has a width and you say well yeah also, it's also restricted by height ah Oh, oh, the magic. The height of the browser isn't restricted because of the whole damn, oh, I shouldn't say that, the whole scrolling thing, right? <laughs> so because you can scroll, then what does height mean, right? What does it mean, right? You, we could say the page is infinity um, and that. And so that was a little thing was, like, oh, that, you know, it was easier. The width, the system can kind of figure out real quick, but the height, you're like, yeah, what if someone scrolls and the height's gonna, that's weird. And so there's a little, there's are some tricks to figure that out, but, right, um, that's just something I noticed that uh, something that because of the scrolling that's inherent in all web pages from the beginning, you know, the height of a web page is an interesting concept. Uh, set the gap while you're designing, right? So use this grid gap. Oh, and by the way, don't use gap, use grid gap. Okay, grid hyphen gap. Uh, so set that. I would even recommend setting different sizes for rows and columns, uh, especially when you first start out. Just keeping, you know, all the visual cues. Am I on a row? Am I on a column? And that sort of thing. What you can do now is pause this video lecture uh, and watch the demo where I sort of build. I'll build a, a grid from scratch using pixels, and then we'll go over... Uh, fractional units as well as template areas in that and in the end template areas seem okay but you I'll be honest for myself I had to go through the transition from pixels to fractional units to template areas and then I was okay with template areas because I needed to learn what all that other stuff was doing and what was affecting what and what was causing me problems and things not lining up and showing up and then and then once I got that sort of stuff sorted out and that was easy as pixels that make something two, 200 by 300 or something um, and that because uh, in the fractional units you know those values get calculated for you and so what is it doing uh, and that and then the map areas and that so that was my transition uh, so you know it was from pixels to fractional units to map areas and that and you'll see me go through that in the demo so if you've watched the demo uh, some of the key properties that you that you'll probably use uh, if you're doing grid layouts one display is equal to grid that's really important versus flex or inline or block and something uh, this one the the v height the 100 minus 8 magic i know on stack overflow they say minus 10 but i guess uh, i guess if tail tailwind the king of some of the uh, frameworks out there for cascade style sheets goes on about this four pixel grid system then I thought, well, it's probably because you got eight, not ten, yeah, uh, and that. Uh, and so, the hundred percent of the vertical height. Uh, once you set that on your the whole grid, uh, then you can then you can sort of infer the uh, row height and that sort of thing. That was my problem was that because of the scrolling, uh, it really can't out of the box figure out the height unless you tell it, and that. Um, and so this is sort of like an indirect way to say, hey, it's 100% of the vertical height and go calculate it. Uh, but then you, if you don't take off about eight pixels, uh, it will feel that there's an overflow issue. And so there's some sort of like four pixel margin all the way around or something like that, that will cause you to overflow if you try to use 100% screen. So already you don't have 100% screen. You have about, well, what, 90, 92% screen. And I shouldn't say percent. You're missing a couple of pixels, just so you know, in that eight to be exact. In that grid template rows, that will tell you that's where you can set like uh, uh, how many rows you're going to have, uh, and that even some fractional unit stuff. Grid template columns as well. Uh, I'm doing rows first because it's row major. In that here's a grid gap uh, recommended that you can actually see it to do make and again eight means a uh, row gap and four means column gap that's why you just get in the habit of going rows columns versus column rows and that because that's the implicit order 
uh, in the cascading style sheet itself in that. Uh, you, you can mention grid lines, right? And this is their notation. This threw me for a bit uh, in that. It's like going, hey, start at, start at grid line like one and go to grid, and this could be like two, and go to, or go to grid line, right? The next grid line number. Uh, so that's one way to say like how big, how this element inside this grid layer, how big is it in that? And so you can do it by uh, grid line number in that. And this is sort of like, this is like saying two. Okay, from grid line one to grid line four, and then this part means two. And that same for column. Okay, this is like saying from this one to this one, it's like the word two. That's their notation. Grid template areas, uh, and that, I actually, you know, like I said, I had, I couldn't avoid going through the process. Can't avoid the work sometimes, you just got to do it. And that, go through the process, and then like, okay, it'll, things will settle down, and that. And in the end, grid template areas started to make sense uh, to me. And that, uh, also, uh, and then uh, you set up your grid template areas for your whole grid, right and that I think you'll see where I went in the end I went like I went map map chart map map KPI for my grid areas and then I could assign uh, when I go hey put the map in the map area it gets those four chunks and that and that sort of thing and if you ever need to float have them overlapping or floating one floating above the other you can apply a Z index to have them uh, I guess where they uh, uh, you know, overwrite another area and that sort of thing. And so we're, those are some of the key properties. And because, like I said, these properties, how they're already specified in W3 Consortium Cascade Style Sheets, they're already using lowercase hyphens, you might as well adopt that convention for yourself, right? Because I used to do IDs, like, in camel case, like, you know, uh, map, map, uh, map view would be, uh, you know, map capital B view. Now, I'm like, okay, I have to change all this, and this is going to be map hyphen view and that sort of thing, just to match. Uh, sort of uh, in this document, I'll do it one way, right? HTML cascading style sheets, and when I'm in code, I do it a different way. In that, instead of having a mix, in that separate part of separation of concerns would be also separating the coding styles and conventions as well. All right, and uh, lots of different CSS units. Okay, so you can. You know, specify stuff in centimeters and millimeters and inches and pixels and uh, points like fonts and stuff like that. Uh, and this is a special type of calculation based on fonts in that. Um, do I have fractional units in here? I didn't put F. I'll have to add FR to the list. It's one of the more important ones. And that. Um, and then uh, vertical, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, the maximum width, the maximum height, and the min your V, your V min, your V max for a particular element. Again, okay, we'll switch gears. And we'll talk a little bit about issue resolution. Okay, so where do you go for help, right? In that, so uh, do I go over to the Maps SDK API to figure this out? Do I go check out a sample? Do like where do I go? I'm having a problem with my code, and, and that sort of thing. So isolation is the key. Crucial, crux, first step to issue resolution, right? And so you gotta gotta figure out, well, is this is this really a ArcGIS JavaScript API issue? Is this really something that the only although it was a Java a JavaScript API thing, it actually only exists in this one sample. Okay? In that. So that's kind of important. Like uh, you go hunting, hey, what's this fine layer thing? And you search the whole API. And it's not there, right? Why? Because it was something someone made in the sample in that. So you just got to be, um, start to develop this muscle memory in that about, okay, uh, if I'm going to fix this, where do I got to go in that? Is this really related to a CDS component? Maybe. And so then you're going to be over on the CalSite design side, trying to figure out over there, trying to figure out, out the issue. Is it just a CalSite slot. So these these are standard web-based components that use slots, and so maybe you're just maybe the name of the slot is wrong for the component you have. It doesn't have a slot called header or something like that. It has you know, it has other things, in that. And so where do you go, All right? So where do you go for help? Is the first thing is where are you in that? And this is this isolation thing. Is the cascading style sheet issue, right? 
I have lots of problems where things aren't showing up and code's fine, right? And that and it's because some style wasn't being applied or some or I couldn't find the style sheet in that. And once I fixed that, hey look, right? There was nothing wrong with my code um, in that. Is it a framework issue? This is important. Like uh, Hey, I'm using the JavaScript, uh, JavaScript API and I'm using Calcite and stuff, but I'm also involved it's a little bit of Vue and React is in here too, and that and and that. And so you, this isolation thing is you got to really put it in a box, and then you know where to go for help in that. So is it an HTML5 issue? But is it pre-HTML5, right? Is this post-HTML5, like the data hyphen thing? Like where'd that come from? Right, so it's a post HTML5 uh, thing, and, and it if, is a JavaScript. And uh, ECMA six seems to be a big one, right? Because uh, that's where the import command came in, and a few other things. In that, um, so are you pre ECMA six or post, right? Because you might be doing something where, hey, you know, that's built into arrays now to filter and reduce, and that you don't have the right uh, a loop to do that. Uh, it's built into the spec, right? Uh, if you're doing JavaScript development, uh, we'll say with ECMA 6 to 2020 local, or you do some sort of remote deal, right? What? How does that affect? The import statements look completely different. Not completely different, but they're not the identical, right? So one is going to a folder in your notes modules, and one is going to, uh, I guess, a relative path in the CDN. So the, the paths don't actually, the import paths don't look the same. And that's why, hey, I saw the sample, but the imports aren't working. It's because, well, it, it was done in a different development mode in that. And are you, you know, uh, are you dealing with a web component? Because maybe if it's a CDS Calcite component, we know where to go. But maybe this is a different type of component. And your expectation was behavior was more based on working with ones with Calcite design. But, hey, this is someone else's. You're going to have to go over there and see how it works. If you need to re-examine a topic or need clarification on a term or concept or just have a question, you can get an answer by posting a note on one of the discussion boards for this course. This concludes this lecture.